Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul channel, and I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. And some people I thank have inspired me. I hope they can inspire you as well. And I will have links below this video to their sites. They are Rabbi Shalom Arash, Rabbi Lazar Brody, Rabbi Yossi Kudrachi, Rabbi Eli Mansur, Rabbi Alon Anava, Rabbi Yuval Ovadia, Rabbi Daniel Asser, Nisan Baruch Black, David Sachs, Rabbi Michael Skolbeck, Jews for Judaism, Rabbi David Ashir, Rabbi Yer, and Rabbi Yaron Ruvain. As well, if you've never checked out this channel before, I will have a link right below this video to my first video, which explains what MLM for this whole means, what it stands for, and what I'm doing. So today is part two of um, some insight into this wonderful uh, stone edition of the Tanakh, which is put out by Art School, and this is their pocket edition. And they will have a link right below this video to their site. And last uh, week on Shabbat, uh, while I posted, when I posted the last video, I posted them on Motzei Shabbat, um, the sad news came in that uh, Rab Rabbi Mayor Ben Rab Aaron Zlatowitz uh, Zechert Tzadik with Kadosh Lubracha, that he actually passed away, um, and uh, I have a familial connection from my mom and his wife's side, and I mentioned that below the video, but today I wanted to actually formally dedicate this, this lecture to his, uh, the Aliyah for his Neshama. Uh, he just passed away, so he's, he's still not uh, fully left this, this uh, world. His Neshama is still here. They're still sitting Shiva when I'm recording this, and today is actually, I'm recording this on Thursday um, afternoon, so... Um, you know, art school is in everyone's world. I don't know who doesn't have something from art school. Just about every person that exists. So what he's done for the world, uh, the Torah world, and otherwise. There's other people who might get their his books as well, even if they're not uh, Jewish. So uh, has had a large impact. You know, he was definitely something that will be remembered um, because of what he's done. I mean, he has a immense impact on the world. So anyway, I wanted to continue with the overview here that was written by Rabbi Nussin Sherman. And I was up to part two, which is called prophecy. So essential to an understanding of Tanakh is the concept of prophecy. Colloquially, people think of prophets as predicators, I'm sorry, predictors of the future or as spokesmen for an, for an ideal. However, although prophets may perform these functions, they are not essential to prophecy. Uh, as defined by the classic Renaissance commentator of Moshe Chaim Lutzato. So what he says, and this is uh, from one of his books, I think it's called Dera Hashem, is what it says here. Part of the prophet's function may include being sent on a mission by Hashem, but this in itself is not the essence of prophecy. Nor is it necessary that a prophet be sent on a mission to others. The essence of prophecy is that one be attached to Hashem and he experiences revelation. So what, from what I've understand, what I've studied also about a person when they become a prophet, they're so, so connected to Hashem. They're like the bond. That's why it comes through because that's their whole life. It's all about Hashem. So the Talmud teaches that there were hundreds of thousands of prophets, but Scripture quotes only 25. What did the rest of them do and why are so few mentioned in Scripture? So by definition, prophets are people who have refined their minds and con conduct sufficient to deserve that Hashem's spirit must rest, could rest upon it. That's what I'm saying. That's what they become. They become just so connected. It was not necessary for them to bring messages to the people. Their greatness was personal. Indeed, prophets were also known as seers, uh, which is written in Shmuel Aleph, because they were people whom Hashem had given insight far beyond that of ordinary people. In a sense, we may compare prophets to outstanding scholars, some of whom may write and teach, while others may devote themselves exclusively to study and personal growth. The way to compare their relative stature is certainly not by counting their published works. The prophets elevated the nation simply by being role models of holiness, scholarship, and closeness to Hashem. In modern times, civilized societies value artists and intellectuals for what they are and for the standards they set for the rest of the community. Governments and philanthropists support them because of the benefits they provide to society. How much more so the people who bring the spirit of Hashem into their communities? That's way more important than the others. In the end, that's really what's going to matter. Um, seeing them, their peers would know that Hashem addressed His Spirit upon them. And this, this itself would raise the level of national aspirations. So according to the Talmud, when Moshe re received the Ten Commandments at, at Har Sinai, Hashem taught him the entire Torah, including the future books of the prophets and writings. Strange, 
how could Moshe have received books that would not be composed for hundreds of years, right? That's a good question. So the answer begins with an understanding of different perspectives. For example, if people were asked to describe their own hypothetical ideal person, the answer would be many and varied. Each respondent would know what he or she admires, but what one considers the ideal person may be a bizarre and repulsive character to someone else. So too, people whose spiritual antenna are attuned to holiness can hear things that others do not. The generation that stood at Sinai, that saw and heard the revelation, that experienced prophecy, that lived with daily miracles, they could feel that divine, the divine presence hovering above them. Such people could hear the teachings of Moshe and detect it, in them the holiness of Shmuel, the inspiration of David, the wisdom of, of Shlomo, and the vision of Yeshaya. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have be on that level? Wow, everyone that was there during Har Sinai, I can't even imagine. They were so imbued with the lessons and perspectives of the Torah that the future teachings of the great prophets had been part of their nature. In the same way that someone who has mastered a field of knowledge knows the contents of elementary textbooks without even having seen them, ever having seen them. He knows them because he had mastered the subject perfectly. And I forgot to get, mention the subcategory was called the essence of prophecy. So the next subcategory is called death to the message. So if it was only later when Moshe and Yoshua were gone and subsequent generations let themselves be seduced by the lifestyles of their pagan neighbors that the clarity of Moshe's teaching began to fade and the people failed to hear its sacred resonance. Because like I said, the levels went down. The Kedusha, the holiness of the generations, kept going down. So the book of Judges is like an introduction to Jewish history, or Shoftim, Judge in Hebrew. The tribes of, of Israel had settled into a complacent coexistence with their Canaanite neighbors, the people they could not bring themselves to drive from the land. Now that was one of their, that was their downfall, really, in the end, because uh, they were supposed to destroy them all. And because they left some of them around, it started to filter into their lives and create problems and Hashem said that before that you can't keep them around because that's what's going to happen they're going to start infiltrating and make problems for you uh, you know with your with your life so inexplicably it seemed foreign invaders defeated the Jews why had Hashem forsaken them had they not been promised that the land would be theirs and that their enemies would crumble before them 300 years after the period of the judges began the prophet Shmuel wrote the book of judges which sets these events in perspective Israel had allowed pagan practices and beliefs to seep into their lives that's what I mentioned yes like a leak too long ignored the seepage weakened the sacred foundations upon which Israel's existence had been based and open breaches through which enemies could swarm into the land so like they say just like my grandmother would always say may she rest in peace Mary and Shem have an Aliyah too um, I'm trying to remember she was uh, uh, Charnabas, I'm trying to think her, her father, Ben Sion, Ben Sion Halevi, uh, yes. Um, so, um, then Hashem would appoint leaders, the people would repent, the enemy would be subdued, and the land would have extended, oh, so I didn't say what I wanted to say, so what she used to say was the stitch in time saves nine, if the stitch is starting to unravel, because she was a dressmaker, pattern maker, so, so if you let the stitch go, if you don't take care of it right away, it's gonna, so the same applies here, so back to where we were, I'll go over it again. Uh, so then Hashem would appoint leaders, the people would repent, the enemy would be subdued, and the land would have an extended period of tranquility until the people sinned again and the cycle was repeated. So again, like we, the, what is the expression of David uh, Amel said, there's nothing new under the sun, everything repeats itself. The theme of the book of Judges, therefore, was that obedience to the Torah earns Hashem protection and sin begets catastrophe, basic knowledge. It does, it's pretty simple, no, nothing complicated to understand. So the generation of Moshe did not need a book of Judges to teach them that they teach them that they saw it in the Torah. Succeeding generations needed Shmuel to place quote history in the context of reality. Reality and events are determined not by geopolitics but by virtue and sin. In contemporary times, we do have both the Torah of Moshe and the book of Judges. Can we say that we have absorbed their message? It is not true that we is it is it not true that we analyze events in terms of national ambitions and greed for resources, in terms of public image and political rivalry? The lessons are there in the Tanakh, but we must open our eyes and ears to see and hear them and to apply them. That is beautifully said by Rabbi Sherman. Again, the lessons are there in the Tanakh, but we must open our eyes and ears to see and hear them and to apply them. So we must, what that also means is we must actually read the Tanakh, because if we don't read it, we won't, we won't learn what those lessons are that we have to apply and, and, and heed, heed as well. So the next subcategory is called a new era. So until Shmuel's time, time, uh, the prophets tend, tended to be only, quote, seers rather than, quote, leaders. The leaders of the nations were the judge, quote, judges. Righteous people chosen by Hashem. But in the days of Shmuel, there was a turning point in Jewish history, the establishment of the monarchy. No longer would every national leader be picked by Hashem. The succession would be hereditary, which meant that the heads of state would not necessarily be righteous. So that's the problem already there. That's how I look at it. 
Some would be models of spiritual greatness, such as David, Shlomo, and Chizkiah, and, and uh, Chizkiah, but they... But there would also be despicable kings like Yeravam, Ahab, and Menashe, who disgraced the nation and pushed it down the slippery slope to destruction and exile. Hard to believe, but yes, this, these things happen. So since the political leaders of the nation failed to be spiritual leaders, the Jewish people needed prophets who would lead the, and admonish. Tasks that had once been belonged exclusively to judges. So that things therefore shifted. That's what I'm saying. In later years, the nation split into two kingdoms, and the spiritual standing of the people began to erode. The nature of the prophecies began to turn from providing perspective and guidance to admonitions that tragedy and exile from their land would be inevitable unless the people repented and relearned the lessons of their past. Such were the courageous uh, public de demonstrations of Eliyahu uh, and Elisha, the stirring poetry of Yeshaya, the terrible personal ideas of Oshea and Yechezkel, and the dirges of Yermia. Other prophecies were encouraging. They came to Israel during times of catastrophic downfall, when the people feared that their bright future was forever behind them, that they that they had forfeited their right to consider themselves Hashem's chosen people. At such times, Hashem would send prophets to inspire the downtrodden people and assure them that the sun would shine again. As the sages put it, Had I not fallen, I could not have arisen. Had I not sat in darkness, Hashem would not have been a, a, a light for me. That's from Midrash to Hillam 22. This too is a message of the prophets. The Hebrew word Navi, a prophet, comes from the term Niv Sifatayim, fruit or expression of the lips. This very title implies the mission of the prophet. He was given a message by Hashem and commanded to express it, to speak to the people and tell them what Hashem had revealed to him. For this reason, the books contain such revela revelations are called prophets. And as the sages explain, only such prophecy as was needed for future generations was written in scripture. That's from Yoma. Thus, there were surely untold numbers of prophets whose personal greatness was equal to those we know from Scripture, but whose messages were not relevant to us, so that's why they weren't mentioned. On the other hand, every word of Scripture has something meaningful to tell future generations, including our own. The next uh, subcategory is called the writings. So not all sacred teachings were meant as divine messages to be conveyed to the people. Those are the writings, or the ketuvim, as we say Hebrew. So called, pro, so called because they were to be quote, not quote, they were to be written because they proclaimed as quote prophecies. But Hashem ordained that they be preserved as part of scripture. The reasons vary. It may have been to provide perspective on history such as the books of Chronicles, Ruth, and Esther. It may have been to provide wise perspectives, perspective on the meaning and conduct of life such as um, King uh, Shlomo HaMelech's Proverbs and Ecclesiastes which is uh, Mishle and, uh, I'm trying to remember what Ecclesiastes is. Um, is that Divrei Hayamim? No. That's Chronicles. Uh, I'm trying to remember what that is. Maybe that's, uh, <laughs> funny how I forgot what that is. Uh, Ecclesiastes is, I should know this, but I don't have it uh, in my head, so we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, uh, it may have been to allude to the future redemption, such as the book of Daniel, or it may have been shed it may have been to shed light on the eternally perplexing question of why the righteous may suffer and why the wicked prosper, such as the heated dispute of the book of Eov. Uh, perhaps the best, or Job, as some people say, perhaps the best example of a non-prophetic work that had a profound effect on countless millions of people is the book of Psalms or Tehillim, which still does and continually does. I, I study it every day. So King David, or David Amel, is more than the, quote, sweet singer of Israel. He is a musician of the soul who plucks at the heartstrings of every Jew and makes sacred music of every life experience. Whatever a Jew needs, he finds it in his book of Tehillim. Gratitude, hope, prayer, aspiration, courage, insight. Millions of, of, of Tehillim um, have soaked up infinite number of tears, tears that Hashem treasures in, in his own treasury. Okay, and the last uh, subcategory is called goal of our study. So let us open our Tanakh and read from it with your receptive minds and open hearts. Let us absorb the teachings as the great 19th century teacher and thinker Rav Shamshin Rafael Hirsch urged us to. The Tanakh, he said, the Tanakh should be studied as the foundation of a new science. Let us look at the nature of, of David Amel as David Amel did. Let us listen to the march of history with the intent ear of the prophet Yeshaya. And with eyes thus open and ears thus attuned, let us draw from Tanakh our lessons about Hashem, the world, mankind. The books of Tanakh should become the source of instruction for life and people should learn to hear their message throughout their lives. Their eyes should be open to see the world surrounding them as Hashem's world and themselves as Hashem's servants in His world. Their ears should be open to perceive history as a process of educating all mankind towards the service of Hashem. As we turn the page to, to begin our study of Tanakh, of Hashem's Torah, prophets, and writings, let this be our goal. We are not studying, quote, literature, though Tanakh is surely prose and poetry of the highest order. We are not studying, quote, history, 
Though Tanakh is surely an authoritative chronicle, we are studying Hashem's word as conveyed to us through the throats and quills of his emissaries. They spoke to their contemporaries as they shall speak to us, for only the words of eternity were immortalized in the sacred scriptures. Let us read with our eyes and listen with our souls, and let us live our lively transform, transform to what Hashem intended them to be. Beautifully said at the end. And uh, let's see if I could find what Ecclesiastes is, because now it's bothering me. Uh, it's Kehelas, that's what it is. Why did I forget that? I don't know. So I just want to say in closing um, that I hope, yes, this is very insightful, and I, I speak this for myself, and I learn a lot just from doing this. And we need to, like Rabbi Nelson Sherman says, read with our eyes and listen with our souls. And our lives should be transformed, and may we help with that transformation that we all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting base, Hamigdash. Amen, and thanks for watching.